my goodness, this is a this is a big crowd. Whoa. How is everyone doing? All yeah. right. Uh, wait, I couldn't hear you. How is everyone doing? Yeah, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so before we get started, okay, uh, uh, I guess we have two goals for today. Right? Jeff doesn't know this, so he's kind of wondering <laughs> what I'm talking about. Uh, the first goal is uh, to get everyone here uh, who's already not into Web3 into Web3. That's right. Uh, and the second goal is if anybody's building a company um, to get you around a co-led, by A16Z and Chapter 1. What do we'll, you think? We'll preempt it right now. There we go. Right. That's, the, yeah, wow, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, OK, before we start, show of hands, how many of you are already working full time in crypto or Web3? All right. That's All awesome. Right. OK, well, you can just sleep for the rest of the stock. Uh, you're already converted. Um, but for the rest of you, OK, we have some fun stuff. OK, let's get going. Um, so. Uh, Jeff and I were kind of talking about this, and you know, we were trying to think about what we want to talk about. And in some ways, this is very deep and personal to us, because when we think about the journey from Web 2 to Web 3, it's actually our personal journeys as well. So we have a bunch of fun things we want to talk about. But first, uh, maybe you start with the story. So Jeff, you have an amazing story. Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, I was a VP of product over at Tinder for um, four and a half years. But um, while I was at Tinder, I discovered CryptoKitties, which um, were kind of the first mainstream NFTs, and I ended up becoming a seed investor in Dapper Labs. But um, at Tinder, we were selling digital subscriptions and uh, saw the power of NFTs, and it just made sense. Like it was like scarcity, zero marginal costs, um, digital goods that created community. And from there, I just I went down the crypto rabbit hole. And um, similar to you, I'm now doing this full time. But um, on another note, I grew up in the Bay so I grew up five minutes down the road, and my, da my dad's here today, so wait, wait, where's, cool. is your dad here? Where's your dad? Where's your dad? <laughs> Whoa, everyone, give, give, can you stand up, sir? Can you stand up? <laughs> everyone, give it up for Jeff's dad. <laughs> your son is awesome. He's amazing. <laughs> That's such a cool moment. All right, now uh, we can get some embarrassing stories of him as a child later. Yeah. Okay. What, yeah. What, why don't we reverse? By the way, I've known Triom for many years, so like the vibe of this, we want to be like two friends. Um, talking about crypto and catching up. So um, we'll, we'll be pretty casual, and um, feel free to, to uh, boo us or shout at us if, if you want any, any, anything to, to go yeah, differently. Don't boo us. <laughs> don't, don't boo us. We, we, I, have, I have thin skin. Um, OK, so, so you're at Tinder, and you're into crypto That's right. Yeah, so um, Nina, actually, who's just on stage, ran a program at Index Ventures called Magnetic. And um, I came into Magnetic. It was their scout fund to basically do crypto. Um, and I ended up doing. Um, invest in the graph and some other projects, and that portfolio um, was like an 18x. And so I was um, pretty sure that I'd, I could find good companies. And um, I started my first fund in 2019. Unfortunately, crypto was in the the bear market, uh, the worst bear market I've ever seen. And so um, I raised Chapter One as a, a generalist fund, and then um, Fund Two is now all crypto. Oh, well. Awesome. Uh, well, Jeff's a fantastic story. I think the thing about Jeff's story, and I think similar to my story, which I'll get to in a minute, is we are both started off in Web2 companies and now in different ways kind of working uh, full-time in Web3. Uh, so, so my story, by the way, uh, um, is uh, I, I sort of, you know, I grew up in India and got into computers out of high school. But what a lot of people probably know me for is I spent the last 10 years working in all the large social media companies. I'm like a nerdy Thanos collecting the infinity gauntlet of social media companies. Thank you, sir. You laugh. <laughs> Much appreciated. Uh, 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 I was practicing that line. But uh, I spent a bunch of years at Facebook uh, helping uh, build out ad products over there. I spent some time at Snapchat and kind of finished my collection. Uh, I spent the last few years uh, at various product roles at Twitter. Sadly, missed out on the Elon Musk era at Twitter, apparently. So, uh, But, but he, did, he did interview Elon Musk if you listen to the Good Time show. Uh, anybody listen to my Clubhouse show uh, with Elon? <laughs> thank you. Uh, oh, wow, that's awesome. Uh, uh, well, I'll be hopefully coming back soon. Oh, thank you for that. OK, so kind of did the trifecta um, and was a very active angel investor uh, for all this while. And about a year and a half ago, I wound up joining Anderson Horowitz. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, it's a, a venture capital firm based here in Silicon Valley uh, as a general partner. 
Now, when I joined, actually, I was what I was supposed to focus on consumer investments and social media because that was really my background. But one of the first investments and in companies I got a partner with uh, is a company called Bitsky. Uh, they do some really interesting things around helping people uh, get access to NFTs. And that was actually my first week at the firm. Uh, and it kind of happened serendipitously. And between that and between the show on Clubhouse, which I co-host with my wife, which had on all these very interesting crypto people, we had Beeple, uh, we had on like all the top collectors, we had amazing founders, you know, all up and down the stack. I got deeply crypto-pilled, uh, as we like to say, um, and then about a month and a half ago, I actually switched full-time to working um, on the crypto team at ac i uh, I'm one of the general partners there, and I spend all of my time thinking, breathing, uh, tweeting. There's a lot of tweeting, uh, I think, uh, and uh, obviously partnering and investing with uh, uh, fantastic founders. So I'm all, all into uh, Web3. Love it. No, I uh, kind of thought that would happen. I saw, you can see when people go down the rabbit hole, it's like they start asking questions, then um, you see them, uh, they change their avatars on Twitter to some PFP. Um, so I saw Sri Ram going in that direction, um, was just so excited when that you happened. Can, you can tell, you can yeah. tell um, from somebody's Twitter account. Okay, maybe, maybe let's start with the absolute basics. So the title of our talk is supposed to be Web2 to Web3. I think everybody here knows what Web2 is about. Um, Jeff, what in Blazes is Web3? Yeah, I love uh, this topic because everyone has a different answer. And Web3, I think, is great, uh, great branding for crypto as a whole. But um, what it means to me is mostly uh, networks and protocols where the ownership shifts to the user. So if I'm an end user of the product, I receive contributions or rewards through tokens um, for everything I do for the network. So it could be creating content. It could be um, serving on governance. There's so many ways you can cont contribute to crypto protocols and projects. And, um, but it's inverting the ownership model to reward the end user um, as opposed to, to Web2 where really um, the networks and the platforms capture most of the value. Um, so that, that to me is the, the ownership model I think is the most exciting part and that's enabled through tokens which um, we can talk about more. Yeah, uh, uh, tokens is very interesting. I mean, I think some of you or you know, if not here or others have this question which is, hey, isn't Web3 just crypto? And, uh, and it, it is and it isn't. Um, and I think the, the one way to think about it is just the story of crypto. So I think everybody here is familiar with Satoshi writing the white paper and the invention of Bitcoin, truly probably like a kind of a big bang moment for uh, crypto. And if you kind of follow along on this journey that I think that happened in the late, uh, you know, the early part of like 2008, 2009, and then the early part of last decade was all about kind of like the initial years of Bitcoin. And then about mid last decade, uh, Vitalik helped build Ethereum. I'm kind of like obviously hand waving over a lot of different things happening here. Um, and I think Ethereum for me is kind of like a truly amazing moment uh, because ETH for me is the global computer, right? Uh, it's a computer which everybody has access to, which everybody can write code on, and that's actually what got me really interested in crypto. So you kind of follow, you kind of go along, and then in, um, and I think 20, 2015, 2016, 2017, all those years you were still building these core infrastructure pieces. Uh, and this is, by the way, when the firm, Andreessen Norwich, but I, mean, I was not here, to, it is, uh, I think a lot of the credit goes to Chris Dixon um, at the firm, you know, was starting to make some of the initial investments into crypto. And this is all about all, a lot of like foundational infrastructure, right? Um, and then we had the ICO uh, kind of like era for a little bit of a while. And then I think in 2019, you had uh, in the summer of DeFi, right? And that unlocked things like Uniswap and Compound and a bunch of other like, you know, really interesting financial applications uh, on top of crypto. Um, but I think in 2020 is when I got really kind of sucked in as not just kind of an observer, but also a real participant because 2020 saw the rise of NFTs and DAOs. Um, and by the way, if folks, if you don't know NFTs and DAOs, I think, you know, there's a ton of, you know, amazing resources you can point you to. But I think the really interesting about NFTs and DAOs was uh, my whole background was a product manager, product consumer psychology. I deal with things in pixels, you know, uh, nobody should trust me to write code. Uh, but for the very first I was like, okay, wait, this, is, this has consumer psychology, uh, this has actual you know, people you know, using things and amazing communities being built. And that's what got me stuck. And I think a lot of other people stuck in which we'll get to. Um, and I think, so all these eras, if you look up, you know, is so much more than what we started off with uh, over 10 years ago. And I think to Jeff's point, I think Web3 is all about 
you know, these, uh, you know, these networks were uh, orchestrated by tokens. Um, and I think it represents the power shift, not just in technology, but also in society uh, and culture. And yeah, so I think that's why the word Web3, I think, kind of captures this I hate the word paradigm shift. It sounds like you know I work at McKinsey, uh, but it really captures a, one person from McKinsey booed me over there. I think. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, but it kind of captures this, this real paradigm shift. I think. But okay, um, so Jeff, uh, next up, I have a kind of list of questions. Yeah. Here. yeah. Uh, why are people moving to Web three? Is it just to make money? What's up? I think this is the mobile moment that we saw in two thousand ten, where you finally have white space. There was a like a deep period in consumer where it felt like Facebook and everything else just could not, you could not beat them, right? Is Facebook a sponsor? I have, I have no idea. Meta? Uh, and now it, it feels like there's finally a chance where um, if you have an interesting go-to-market through airdrops or your, your ownership structures, you can really build um, interesting consumer applications that make a ton of money without needing the same network effects. So um, one of the hard, hardest things actually for me as a, as a crypto VC is to um, adjust my mental models for like what like what should like a great monthly active user base look like, um, and in the case of OpenSea, there's only 500,000 monthly active traders, uh, and they're doing over five billion dollars in trading volume per month. So you can you can build really big businesses, and why I think this is exciting for builders is you don't have to go out and build a network that gets you know two billion users to to have a great uh, a great company that almost looks like a, a massive public company. You really just need um, half, 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 a, half a million really passionate users. And for a lot of people, that feels a lot more achievable, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, all to, uh, by the way, Jeff mentioned, I think, Web2 and the mobile which is very interesting. Uh, I'm going to kind of like age myself here. Uh, how many of you remember the 2005 era of Ajax and Web2? Okay, there's three other old people here. <laughs> all right, okay. Uh, yes, we are all, uh, oh my goodness, uh, I feel so old. Uh, uh, yes, yes, oh my God, there's only a few hands. The rest of you, so young, so annoyingly young. But, okay, so so that was a moment in time in, say, 2004, um, you know, um, before you were born, uh, <laughs> where it felt like, it felt like, you know, there was a real seismic shift, right? Um, you know, we, it, it seemed like, and there was a bunch of things that happened. Gmail came out. Ajax came out, REST APIs came out, Tim O'Reilly threw, I think, like 500 conferences in like one year, um, and it felt like also kind of a power to the people, right? I think it was a rise of user-generated content. The long tail, anybody remember the long tail? Uh, yeah, like, sir, you're old, yes, I know, we, we've established that. Uh, <laughs> and, but then it felt like this real paradigm shift again, where you know, instead of the old models of software development, instead of the old models of like top-down culture, you had power to the people. And that was the era of like Flickr, and then YouTube, and then all these, anyone remember uh, Delicious? Oh, yeah, awesome, Yahoo Pipes? <laughs> uh, uh, nobody, okay, wow, all right, uh, two for two, okay. So, but how old are you, Sri Ram, jeez? Very, very, uh, uh, very old, oh my God, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and, but that felt like a true moment where you had this technology shift, but you all, and the shift was not just about technology, but also about, uh, you know, instead of having a centralized encyclopedia, you had Wikipedia. Instead of having a centralized Zagat review service, you had Yelp, and you had all these kind of like uh, proxies, and that felt amazing and powerful and epic. But I think what wound up happening, if you look at the next 10, 15 years, is there was a dream of that era of power to the people and open access. But for some reason, um, you know, power really got concentrated in a few central institutions. And by the way, I was a part of some of these institutions. I love it. I think a lot of amazing things came out of that. Uh, but you know, I, I think somewhere along the way, we lost that spirit of, hey, anybody can write any piece of code. You get open access to get data and just build fun, amazing new things, right? And we kind of moved into a world of gatekeepers and stores and uh, you know, take rates. Um, and for a bunch of reasons, which I know we can kind of talk about later. Um, and you know, for me now with Web3, it feels like that moment all over again, where you can have permissionless innovation, very different technology stack, obviously, than the rest. But the idea that anybody here 
can go build an amazing company. You don't have to ask anybody for permission. All you need to do is have a cool idea, you know, build a community together, and you're off to the races, right? So, and, and there's obviously technology things which power that, there's cultural things which power that, there are financial tools which power that, and, you know, we can spend hours talking about that, lots of, you know, content on that. But I think it's, it's, it feels like that moment again, and that's what got me really interested. Um, I think when I talk to people who want to move to Web3, I think there is a misconception, right? Which is, I think a misconception is it's just about money, right? It's people are getting rich. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I mean, look, obviously, you know, um, uh, there are some people who, for that, it's going to be more matter. But when I talk to all of my peers who used to work at all the large social media companies or all the fan companies, I think it comes down to two things. Um, the first one is, we now know how to build a Web2 consumer app. You know how to throw up a React page. You know how to throw up like a backend service on AWS or Google. It's kind of like, you know, I'm not going to say it's, uh, uh, you know, it's understood completely, but it's like there is kind of a playbook that everybody knows how to tackle, right? Uh, SEO, uh, ads, you know, how to do growth, social uh, influencer marketing, all of it. With Web3, everything is brand new. Right? Like every day I'll meet a founder who has a token design or a community design, which is unlike anything else ever, right? And to be honest, often like we have no idea what's going to work and what doesn't. So it feels like we are in 2004 and people are talking about, hey, all these things are possible again. Or when the iPhone first came out, people like, all these things are possible again. And so there is this kind of, I mean, I talk to like, all, I spend a lot of my time talking to kind of just builders, engineers, you know, product managers, designers, and they're just like, okay, I have this whole new canvas, and I don't know what's going to work, but it is fun. It is so, f can I swear? So <laughs> freaking fun. Like, I'm going to get bleeped out. Um, and I think so that is, I think, a huge part of it. Um, and honestly, that's kind of why I came in, because yeah. it just felt so fun. It feels so new, because we don't know what's possible. That's one big part of it. I think the other part of it is somewhat philosophical, maybe even political, which is for a lot of people, like, they're like, hey, the internet was not supposed to be, you know, all about centralized power. And I think Web3, and I want to kind of get, get your take on this, kind of represents a shift in power from centralized institutions where you don't have to ask permission from one small set of people. Anybody can go build anything they want. So uh, that's kind of what I see. But Jeff, so I know you care about this, but I want to ask you. Um, how do you think Web3 tackles existing power structures? Because I think that that's one of the things that you know, we've been talking about, too. Yeah, I like to separate between venture capital and um, entrepreneurship. So I think on the venture capital side, we're in this moment now where like the top 10 funds, um, there's so much white space to become a top 10 fund right now, where when I started my fund three years ago, um, it kind of felt like those seats at the table were taken, and it would take some enormous uh, change in... in venture to, to displace that. And now I really think in, in five to 10 years, you'll look back on, um, especially within crypto, um, like who the top 10 funds are. And it will just shock you. Um, funds today that are being built or have not been created yet, um, the, the legacy names of the past truly don't matter anymore. Wait, wait, I'm trying to figure out, is he complimenting A16Z no, or I, is I he give, like, I, I'm just trying to figure <laughs> that out in here. I give, it, I mean, you, you all were the pioneers, I think, of, 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 of recognizing this and saying, hey, we need to create another um, part of our organization that's entirely dedicated to doing crypto all day long. Um, I think it's really hard. You see venture funds who are hiring like one partner to come do crypto. And just foundationally, what, what founders are asking for is so much different from what Web2 Venture offers. And so um, if you're creating a, a fund right now, it's just this really exciting moment of optimism that you can go be one of those top 10 funds. You do need to build um, your firm in a much different way, which would be a long conversation, but, um, but that's really exciting. And then I think, um, yeah, I think for founders, it's, um, I mean, we're seeing the shift. It's, it's happening right now where 70% of the Stanford uh, engineering class this year is going to build in crypto. Um, we, you know, you go to conferences and it's so tangible that this is where people are spending time. Um, that said, there's there's only 18,000 developers in crypto right now, relative to 15 million developers globally. So that's still a pretty small um, set of people, but we're still really, really early. And I'm just um, building a fund is so much uh, fun right now. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you. You feel this way too. Oh, well, I think uh, so. Jeff Twiskers has kind of built such an amazing institution in such a small period of time, has a whole team of people. I get to kind of, you know, sort of 
you know, like there's so much institution that didn't build already for me by Mark and Ben and the team here. So Jeff's done such an amazing job in such a small period of uh, uh, time. By the way, you know, one interesting thing that you just pointed on the developer side is uh, I think there's a perception, and for folks, you know, who are in crypto, you'll get this. Folks who are not in crypto, there's a person that we are, folks in crypto are very price obsessed or, you know, we're just looking at some, you know, the coin tickers all day long. I don't think that's true. But what I look at is there's a recent report which came out from, uh, I think, uh, Avichal and the Electric Capital folks, which tracks, like, developer activity on GitHub on crypto-related projects. Uh, it's kind of, like, it's not super perfect because it's kind of sometimes hard to tell what a crypto-related project is, but it's very good dash and signal. And that, that chart is, like, you know, it just kind of really speaks for itself. And so when I look at that, like, that is real because, you know, if because that is actual human beings, a lot of people that we would know, really smart people spending their actual time and energy just building fun stuff, right? And a lot of it's not kind of the day job, they're just kind of building it in fun for nights and weekends. And for those of us kind of in the technology ecosystem, we know now that the things that smart people do on the nights and weekends tend to be the amazing companies and the amazing institutions in five, 10 years. So like, I, I remember looking at that graph and I was making the move to crypto, and I was like, that is real, because that is actual people spending actual time writing code, building stuff, stuff, and a lot of it may not work, some of it may work, but I know like that will lead to amazing things. So um, I think there's another interesting thing about crypto, which is about like the shift to power. Um, uh, I think Bezos has this famous line about like your margin is uh, uh, opportunity. my opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure he says it much in public anymore. Uh, but I think Chris Dixon points out that crypto kind of takes a version of that. So one of the reasons, if you look at the, you know, in the last year and a half, some of the the spaces which have gotten very hot in crypto, one is I would say music and entertainment, and the other is gaming. And you could ask yourself, like, why? Like, why music? Like, why did that industry kind of show up first, right? And we are obviously investors in, in a bunch of companies uh, like Royal, but also you see so many artists doing NFTs and you know, kind of really being leading edge adopters. And part of it is because if you look at the music industry, it's one of those where uh, there are so many middlemen between you know an amazing artist producing some you know an, let's say an amazing piece of music and the fan who wants to go cheer them on the stadium or go stream the stream their music there are so many middlemen taking and each person takes like some um, a bit of money obviously right and I think if you, one of the things that Chris Dixon pointed out to me is if you look at like every historical technology trend, it's often the people who are the most underserved or are paying the most tax who wind up adopting the next technology uh, uh, shift. So if you're a musician, they were like, wait, I can now sell my music directly to my fans and I get 100% of the dollars and you know I can just hang out with them on a Discord or I can get them an event. That is very powerful, right? So I think that's why we are seeing kind of music being such an early adopter. Uh, I think similarly, Gaming is a, uh, another interesting um, part of it. So there's a famous story, uh, Vitalik, the founder of uh, Ethereum, you know, one of the things that kind of you know, prompted the, you know, some of the early creation of uh, Ethereum and his think of the DAO is, uh, and I don't know how apocryphal the story is, I think Vitalik said part of it is true, is that his favorite character in World of Warcraft was nerfed, right? Kind of like reduced in power, and he got so upset. Um, and, um, and part of it, and I think one of the reasons I think we're seeing this rise in so much gaming around crypto is a bunch of people are like, hey, you know what, I'm spending all of this time grinding, playing, you know, all these games, uh, but I'm not seeing any real value from it, right? Um, and which is why if you look at the rise of like, you know, um, a lot of the crypto gaming, it's about how do we take back some of the value being generated and it hand it over to the community. I mean, you've been spending a lot of time in a lot of these spaces too. Yeah, I think on the music side, what's interesting, and this is probably a misconception of NFTs, they're not just digital art. It's really um, the evolution of subscriptions. And so you're subscribing to be a part of a community. Um, that subscription is liquid. So when you contribute to the community and, and create more value, when you churn, if you choose to churn, you actually sell that subscription for more yep. uh, more, 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 more money on an open marketplace. And so compare this to any Web2 subscription. So say you were um, a Spotify subscriber and you listen to an artist a lot, you share their music online, um, you're an active supporter. When you churn, you're you get nothing, um, and you, and you. Not only that, the artist has no idea who you are. They can't communicate with you. Um, they can't airdrop NFTs to you or tickets. Um, so it's um, you know I think NFTs are really subscriptions with like a built-in CRM. Um, and so when people talk about NFTs being JPEGs, um, I think they 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 haven't quite done enough work to understand what's um, what they actually represent. 
Uh, I love that. Uh, the CRM is great. Uh, there's, I think there's all an interesting point here about uh, what you leave when you leave a platform. So let me ask you a question. Like, how many of you folks are on Twitter? Okay, almost every. How many of you are on Instagram? How many of you are on TikTok? Okay. Uh, now, all of you are adding value to these platforms, okay? Now, how many of you have a say in the decisions made by any of these companies? I mean, some of you might work there. Okay, you will get it. So, you, sir, uh, how many of you are on the cap table of these companies? Uh, well, I think there is one of the things I think which kind of, you know, one of the patterns I've been seeing more and more is, and by the way, all these are amazing companies. I have lots of friends there, and, you know, these companies have been amazing for my career. So, this is really <laughs> not meant as a, you know, a diss at them. Um, a, a, but, you know, one of the ways I think Web3, you know, is bringing new kinds of institutions is a lot of people are like, hey, I am contributing value to these platforms, but I have no participation in the economics, and I have no participation in governance, right? Like, even the smallest Twitter user, you have no following, right? You're, I was a Twitter, you're adding value to Twitter, right? If you're on Instagram, you know, you're adding value to Instagram, right? But Instagram is probably not sending you a check, or Twitter's not sending you a check, and TikTok's not sending you a check, Google's not sending you a check. And I think one of the most interesting kinds of companies that I've been spending a lot of time, spending a lot of time seeing is saying, hey, how can we take um, you know, some of these web two kinds of companies or use cases, but then say, what would it mean if you could take, let's just say, I'm just going to, I don't want to name companies, let's take an abstract social media network or a gig economy startup, right, or any kind of, but then where you have, you know, economics and governance. So for instance, let's set a social media, let's take a marketplace, right? It could be a two-sided marketplace, it could be like something with a gig economy, it could be something where you live somewhere, it doesn't really matter, right? The, almost every marketplace has a phenomenon where on the supply side, you have a small set of people who are contributing really outsized value. Um, and I think one thing I've been seeing with a lot of interesting Web3 companies now um, is how do we then give those small set of like, could be drivers, could be hosts, you know, could be delivery people, could be really anybody, could be artists. Like how do we give them economics, which is like you get to participate when we make more money, you get, some, you get to capture some of that, but you also get a say in every single day. I think so this is like probably one of the most interesting you know, technology, which really gets me very excited. Yeah, I think a lot of this comes from um, out of the gig econ economy, we realize a lot of the gig workers weren't actually doing well financially. Um, and so there were all these moments that have led to this point, but I think um, definitely the gig economy um, and, and the narrative that, that came from that is one. It was just, uh, and then obviously the old social media networks, I think if old, they, ooh, uh, you web, like web two networks have just taken a beating. And so there was, um, you know, a lot of times we think about venture like, um, like does it does it have like the right zeitgeist fit? Um, and right now, like this culturally, just um, it 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 works. Um, and yep. people people and you you mentioned kind of the power of the people um, idea. I think so many examples of DAOs, um, Constitution DAO, probably being the most fam famous example. But we see this across the board with DAOs doing unbelievable things when you can get a group of um, a thousand plus people to agree to, to, to a like contribute financially, but but create value for an asset. It's amazing uh, what you can create relative to uh, traditional mm -hmm. ownership structures. Um, well, well, I think there's one interesting point there, which you know, again, I'm stealing from Dixon. Uh, Dixon likes to say that no Web3 project or company has to spend money on marketing, right? Like Constitution DAO, like had to spend zero dollars on marketing. It's basically because when you're a part of the community, like you're participating uh, in it, you know, either because you want to, or in some of the other DAOs, like because you get part of the economics. So like it, that's one of the un unlocks about Web3 and tokens, which is it's almost a marketing engine more than it is an economics engine. Okay, I know we have two and a half minutes left. I know I want to get to one question right at the end, which is. Uh, how, if you are here listening, watching us on Twitter, wherever, and you kind of heard about Web3, but you don't really know where to start, you heard of NFTs, DAOs, where should somebody, what should somebody do right now to get started? Yeah, I think there's one great uh, website called rabbithole.gg um, that you can go to, and they basically have crypto quests that you can, um, you can go do to, to learn DeFi or, um, or anything else. So that's one, but I think, a piece of advice I have is crypto is this big, massive ecosystem, and I think what gets people, um, I guess, creates like some like hesitation to jump in is you don't pick a part of crypto to dive into. So um, I would kind of narrow it down to a few areas. One would be like join a DAO, um, and if you DM me JMJ on Twitter, like I'll recommend DAOs you can join. Um, buy an NFT that represents a membership. Um, uh, so and then as part of that, join the Discord and start. 
um, participate in the community, maybe even participate in governance, um, see what it feels like to vote on chain. It's a pretty cool feeling, and um, you'll find yourself just going deeper down the rabbit hole. Uh, I, I don't know if you what, what you recommend, but um, there's no shortcuts. Like you just gotta gotta go jump in. Um, I I, yeah. I I totally agree. I think. Uh, you can read all about crypto, and by the way, we have some fantastic. I mean, just plugging AC since we have like a crypto canon, which I think is uh, pretty awesome. But crypto is so much of a community and a lived experience. So if you are here, I would say you know outside of you know like join a DAO, buy an NFT, but you have to jump in, roll up your sleeves, and that could mean, for example, if you're technical, write some code, write a smart contract, you know, play with Solidity, you know, just deploy something onto a chain, but then also you know get part of a community, and that means jump into a Discord, see what's happening, see what the chatter is like. Uh, you know, uh, you know, jump into a Telegram group. Um, and by the way, the first one, the first two, the first five may not be the right for you, but I trust me, that'll be one that is right for you. But even more, you'll kind of understand what people are talking about, why this thing works. But it, at the heart of it, I think crypto is about people. And so you have to understand how the community works and why basically you can almost kind of take something which is meme and make it into reality. So uh, roll up your sleeves, slide into his DMs, my DMs, um, and then jump in. Okay, we're almost out of time. One last thing. Give us one final takeaway before we wrap. Final takeaway. Um, yeah, I would say I, I think you, it's what we said before, like you really have to own crypto for a sustained period of time and be a part of multiple cycles to um, develop, I think, like the patience and um, the stomach to get through um, the, the ups and downs. So um, if you do jump into crypto, like please stay and... Um, I promise it'll be a fun place and you'll learn so many great things. I love that. Uh, jump in, stay. I'd also say, uh, you know, um, I think speaking for Jeff and I, you know, we love trying to handhold people, getting them into Web3. Those of you already in Web3, you don't need us, but uh, if anybody has a question, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, join a company, if you want to start a company, you know, please uh, uh, DM us, slide into our DMs. Uh, you know, our emails are pretty easy to find. We love nothing more than talking to people about crypto, getting people into crypto, um, and, uh, you know, that's, but what I live for. So hope this was fun. Everything here was fun except the part where I felt really old. Outside of that, <laughs> everything was fun. But uh, thank you. Thank you that so much. That was awesome. Thanks, Jerome.